So welcome everyone uh, in the Linux Publix Conference in 2021, and in particular uh, in uh, System Boot and uh, Security Micro Conference. Uh, at the beginning, uh, I would like to get you familiar with what will be happening uh, in our room and uh, what are the rules here. So at the beginning, I would like to thank you, our sponsor, uh, our Yamun sponsor of Facebook, uh, our Platinum sponsor IBM, and uh, gold sponsors ARM and Microsoft, silver sponsors AWS and Netflix and Red Hat, different gift sponsor uh, who is Collabora, t-shirt uh, sponsor VMware, and conference uh, services uh, uh, for conference services, the, the Linux uh, Foundation. And uh, in particular, I would like to thank you also uh, Linux Plumbers Conf uh, Conference Committee who um, organized all, all the event. Uh, as far as I can tell, this is a very difficult task. So I would like to thank you, uh, them to uh, make uh, possible uh, this event happen. So this is, this is very important. Uh, um, also, I, I would like to um, uh, thank uh, Peter uh, from FreeNDEP and Matt uh, Garrett for doing this uh, micro conference together with me. Uh, Peter and uh, Matt will be helping uh, me to drive this uh, micro conference. Additionally, Matt agreed uh, to take notes during uh, this micro conference. Also, I would like to remind you about uh, the anti harassment policy. Uh, during uh, uh, Linux Plumbers conference and in particular our our room, and there is also some house uh, housekeeping. So uh, we have a uh, uh, very nice tool, uh, Big Blue Button, uh, which runs the con conference right now. Uh, we and we have uh, a few tools. Uh, first of all, uh, of course, we can use camera and microphones, but um, uh, if you want to speak up, just uh, first of all. Turn or uh, turn on your camera, uh, and then uh, wait uh, until somebody uh, ends uh, speaking or raise uh, raise your hand. Uh, so this this is very uh, very important. Uh, also, I would like to ask you to uh, uh, mute your microphone if you do not uh, uh, speaking to avoid some no uh, avoid some no uh, noises. Uh, we have a chat uh, on, uh, in the left uh, upper corner. Uh, this is, uh, I hope that it will run without any issues this, uh, this time. Uh, so we can uh, chat during um, the presentation and ask uh, some questions. And uh, also Matthew will be putting uh, some notes into, into the shared, shared notes. Uh, we have uh, uh, four uh, presentations in, in our room. Uh, after that, we have some spare time, so we are happy to make uh, some more discussions if you want to discuss some topics related to the system uh, boot and security. So I think that's it from my side. Uh, Peter, uh, Peter, Matthew, would you like to add something? I believe there is a question from, from Stuart, how we, he can uh, deliver the presentation for you. Uh, I've uploaded uh, the presentation with the system, uh, so when uh, you start the before starting the presentation, I will make you a presenter and uh, uh, turn on your presentation. I hope okay. that's good. So, so the question is for Stuart if he uploaded the most recent version. Uh, okay, uh, so he, he mentioned he did uh, he did uh, upload the presentation. Yes, it, it, the most recent one's uploaded. Okay, that's great. Uh, so, so uh, the presentation which uh, was on the Linux Plumber conference is the, uh, the latest one. Yes. Okay, thanks a lot. So I uploaded it, it for you. And I will, I will share it uh, uh, when, uh, when it comes, when time comes. Okay, uh, so we will start with present, uh, first presentation in six minutes. Uh, 
Daniel Axtens, I will make you a presenter and uh, will share your, your presentation. Are you okay with it? Sorry, give me a second. Now you are presenter. Hello, Daniel. Nice to meet you. 
Okay, let's get started. The first presentation will be made by Daniel Axens working for IBM, and he will be co uh, talking about Grab modules in Rust, and I'm very excited as a Grab maintainer to hear, to hear what will be happening with this. Okay, over to you, thank you. Uh, Daniel, you are muted, I think. We cannot hear you. We cannot still hear. Something doesn't work. I think your mic is muted. Somehow. Nope. Nothing. How's that? Okay. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. I disconnected and reconnected from the audio, so yeah. <laughs> right, so <laughs> uh, grab okay. modules in Rust. Uh, so um, I want to just briefly talk about uh, what I'm doing and what I'm not doing. Uh, so what I'm, I'm trying to do here is to give us an opportunity to discuss uh, how we would go about writing uh, modules in Rust for Grub. Um, I'm not trying to replace Grub. I'm not trying to rewrite all of Grub. I'm not trying to make Rust a requirement for building Grub. Uh, th these sort of last three points sort of go together. I'm not trying to break your backwards compatibility. I'm not trying to break Grub for Itanium. Uh, I just want to make it possible for us to write Rust modules in Grub as an option uh, for platforms where we have uh, acceptable levels of Rust support. Just in terms of background for myself, I've been hacking on Grub now for about two years, um, and mostly I'm a C programmer. Uh, I'm not yet a Rust expert per se, um, so that that's yeah where I'm coming from. Um, so big question to sort of start off with is why bother at all? My hope is that this has sort of been addressed by a number of the previous talks in the conference. Uh, in particular, we've seen a lot of, of discussion with the Rust for Linux stuff about squashing bugs related to uh, unsafety uh, and how Rust prevents you from writing those things in the first place. I'm going, therefore, to not reconvince you of that now and use the time instead to hopefully make space for discussion of the things in Rust that we are uh, in Grub where I'd, I'd like some input from the community. I think for Grub specifically there are, are some things where Rust is quite nice. Uh, Rust C compatibility is quite good. Um, you know, ELF, every, you can do calls via the ELF ABI, you can call C code, you can be called via C code. One of the things that's quite nice for our purposes is that we don't have a big heavyweight runtime that we need to pull in, um, which is quite nice. Platform support's quite good, although not perfect. Uh, so we can't rust. Currently, modulo the work that we heard about earlier in the conference with the um, GCC front end or the GCC back end. Uh, Rust is LLVM based. LLVM supports many, but not all of the platforms that we support. So you can't currently build for Itanium, for example, which Rust does support. Uh, so that's annoying. Uh, what I think might be a solution for us is that we can provide, because of Grub's modular architecture, we should be able to just write uh, both a C version or ship our existing C version of a module and a new Rust version of a module and just compile them based on whatever platform it is that we end up building for and what tools are available on the build machine. The other thing where I want to highlight that I'm standing on the shoulders of giants here is that uh, Rust for Linux has worked on so many of these problems before uh, and a lot of people have been doing Rust in embedded systems before. So a lot of this will be talking about how we can learn from Rust for Linux and, and what we want to do based on, uh, especially what they've already figured out. Uh, I have some slides here that have now been rendered very much uh, repetitive by some previous uh, presentations at Plumbers. So 
you have a lot of bugs in large C++, C and C++ code bases that come from memory and safety. Um, for us in Grub, a lot of our, not, <laughs> it's only 40%, still very bad, obviously. It would be nice to have less, 40% fewer bugs. Um, a lot of, yeah, we've had a number of CVEs that are just plain memory and safety bugs. Uh, we've had a number that are logic errors, which basically have been forgetting to disable things in secure boot. And we've had a number of integer overflows. Um, I reckon 40% is an underestimate. Uh, the category of logic errors, uh, I think is not going to grow as quickly as the category of memory and safety and integer overflow bugs. Um, and also for the CVEs, we didn't assign a CVE to every memory and safety bug that we fixed. Uh, so for example, heap out of bounds reads uh, we fixed without assigning CVEs uh, because a DOS isn't really relevant to the secure boot threat model. So yeah, we can fix bugs. Um, but I don't want to tell you why Rust is great. Uh, what I really want to do is spend some time going through the uh, presentation, sorry, going through the code that I wrote that I sent to the Grub mailing list and then I have a set of questions uh, that I've, that my work has raised for me that I want to see if I can get some input from the Grub community on. And I also want to provide an opportunity for people to ask questions about what I've done so far and how it works. So what I'm going to try to do is share my screen. Uh, hopefully this will work. If it doesn't, let me know because I have got in the slides a bunch of screenshots. Uh, so if this doesn't work, all is not lost. So hopefully you can now see, um, I'll just drag this over to another screen so I can see what's going on. Hopefully you can now see a bit of a grub make file. I can see nothing. Uh, sorry, no, Daniel. Not yet. Okay. Hmm. Let me turn off the webcam and see if that. Makes it easier for it to catch up. Okay. Uh, the slides it is. It doesn't work, unfortunately. That's all right. So, uh, can you hear me and see me and see the presentation again? May you should switch between uh, the presentation and sharing the screen. Maybe it is impossible to do that in parallel, I think. You tried it? I don't know how to stop doing the presentation. Uh, at, the, at the bottom of the screen, on the left side, mm. you have a plus. Uh, yeah. Uh, and you have to press the plus, and I think that you should see something, share the screen or something like that. Yeah, I've... I've got a separate screen sharing button, but I think what I'll do just so as not to get completely bogged down in this is just use the, um, this, here's, here are some screenshots I prepared earlier for this precise <laughs> set of circumstances. Uh, so I don't want to look at those because they're actually really boring. Um, what I wanted to start with was something I didn't take a screenshot of. Uh, <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, I am using Wayland, I think, but I was sharing a window rather than the whole screen, um, so who can say. Um, so we've got some stuff in, this is configure.ac. Uh, configure.ac, we say um, we will support Rust if we provide this thing, this Rust target JSON file, uh, which is a file that tells the Rust compiler how to build uh, a Rust binary for this specific platform. So we use this uh, not just to say we're building for x86 uh, or we're building for power, um, but to say things like 
don't have uh, don't use hardware floats or don't use vector don't use um, SSE uh, those sorts of things uh, we test for some various programs and we there are other tests in here as well we check that we can that the compiler works basically um, we have some horrifying bits of uh, gentpl.py uh, where we basically look for um, a make file can now specify a crate and some Rust sources. And uh, because we use, rather than having everything in makefile.am, we have things like makefile.core.def, which gets processed by this script gentpl.py into makefile.am, which is then auto configured um, into makefile.in and configured into makefile and then built. Uh, we need some extra magic to detect that we're building a crate and to actually build it. Um, it it's fiddly and messy, but it mostly works. This is an example of the uh, target.json file that I mentioned before. So this is the one for PowerPC. Most of this comes from Rust C's ability to just spit out the target.json file for the target that you're talking about. Uh, so most of the first part of this is largely unmodified from just the output of Rust C, the defaults. Where things change a little bit are these features. So we disable Altavec, which is a vector, uh, VSX, another sort of vector, vector scalar extensions, uh, disable hard float. We turn on static relocations, a large code model, and so on and so forth. Uh, and we see similar sorts of things. In, so I have in the series I sent to the mailing list, uh, a file for x86-64 EMU, x86-64 EFI, ARM-64 EFI, and PowerPC IEEE-1275. Most of them uh, follow very, very similar sorts of things. They're almost entirely the defaults with just the sorts of things that we detect in configure.ac, so like large code model static relocations, um, and various options to disable SSE and vectors and those sorts of things. Um, so they're not like, they're a bit magic, uh, but a lot of the stuff we can borrow from Rust for Linux or we can get Rust to generate for us. Um, we have some code, and uh, it's, a, it's a shame I don't have a diagram, I guess, of how this fits together, but we need a little bit of glue code to tell Rust how to interact with Brub. One of the things that we need to tell Rust specifically is how to do memory allocations. Uh, Rust just assumes you can allocate memory. Uh, so we tell it how to allocate memory, um, which basically boils down to, uh, we get a request for memory allocation, try and determine whether we've got a valid size, try and determine whether we've got a valid alignment, and then just ask grub mem align uh, for the size. So this reference to bindings, uh, we do the same sort of thing that every C project, every Rust project calling it to C seems to do, um, which is called bind gen, which parses your header files uh, with Clang and generates a bunch of Rust bindings for those from those header files. Um, we support we support building with Clang. Uh, it certainly works uh, because I test it quite a lot. I don't know if anyone does it uh, on a regular basis, but yeah, building with Clang seems to work fine. So we haven't, I haven't had any problems with that so far. Uh, and then if you deallocate some memory in Rust, we pass it straight through to Grub Free. Um, also need to handle Rust panics and Rust out of memory errors. So one of the th things I want to talk about with Rust is a lot of Rust code in the Rust standard library assumes that memory allocations will succeed and if they don't, it panics. Um, this is probably not ideal for us. Uh, we might want to not do that. Uh, it's also not ideal for Rust for Linux. Um, and so they've done a lot of work with failable allocations. And as you can see, there are lots of to-dos here, like we should extract a bunch of information from 
uh, like if we're asked if we've failed to allocate memory we should print out what sort of memory allocation failure we've got uh, and we should print out some of the information about the panic but you know so far I've yet to hit a panic so I have yet to test any of these code paths um, what's next so all the grub bindings are extremely unpleasant to work with it's one of the things that um, I've tried to do mostly as a demonstration is just to look at what it would look like to abstract some of the C APIs into more idiomatic Rust. Now, as I said, I'm not uh, yet much of a Rust developer, so this is still a little bit hairy. Um, but this, for example, creates this grub command Rust structure, uh, which contains a grub command T member and then we create a new function uh, on this struct so you can call new with your name the function that you want uh, as your command callback the summary and description it registers it for you uh, and then the nice thing about this is we can say when the command when this rust structure so you create this grub command when that goes out of scope uh, of when that when its lifetime ends, this drop function is called and so it automatically gets unregistered uh, and you don't need to do quite so much thinking about that, uh, which is just kind of cute. Um, this is about a minimal example of how we could make things slightly more ergonomic. There is a lot more that we could do. Uh, I just wanted to try something uh, to demonstrate some of what, what could be done. Um, and then I've created a module that just says hello. Uh, one of the things that is a constant pain point here is that there is a lot of RAS, a lot of grub that makes a lot of assumptions about what you can do with C preprocessor macros. So I have created at the moment a C wrapper file, uh, which gets linked in, which gets compiled and linked with the Rust static library that gets built. Um, and that wrapper file defines the module license and provides uh, these a grub mod in it and grub mod finny, um, which hook into some of the build infrastructure to create the module list files so that, and to do things like make the um, Rust module get linked into the Grub emulator binary and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of magic that's done with C preprocessor macros. Um, the module itself, this is a, snip, a snapshot of it. Uh, we start here in Grub Rust hello init. We create this new Grub command uh, with the um, Grub command colon colon new. Um, takes the name is Rust hello, that is the Rust hello command. Um, it's currently my summary and description are a little bit lacking. Uh, we stash the command that we get back into a singleton uh, and then we print uh, hello from Rust. And so this function here we have to say x don't c, so it's cabi compatible. And we say no mangle. So rather than getting, if you're familiar with how C++ renames symbols, similar sort of deal, uh, Rust gives its symbols interesting names. Uh, we say don't do that here. So that uh, the when you go to load the module, the grub um, module loader can find the symbol named grub rust hello in it. Um, the command callback itself doesn't need no mangle because we call it through a function pointer, but we do say x turn c so that we get the ABI right, uh, and that just prints hello from my command written in Rust, uh, and in something that very much should be cleaned up, uh, returns grub or none through this um, not pretty invocation. Um, and so this I should take some screenshots of it working, uh, but if you look at the uh, series I sent to the mailing list, you can download it and you can apply it. Um, 
uh, and there's a test and it works on the uh, grab emu, it works on x86 64 EFI, uh, ARM 64 EFI, and PowerPC IEEE 1264. Um, in Quemu, I have not tested any of these on real hardware yet, uh, but I don't foresee any weird problems there. Uh, maybe that's overly optimistic for me. So that's a whirlwind tour, not quite as whirlwind as I had hoped, but what I really want to do with what's left of my time, and then hopefully in discussion later, is talk about some questions that have come up. Um, so the sort of preliminary question is, do we want Rust at all? Uh, I'm going to assume that we do. Uh, and if we, you know, if you want to bike shed that, let's bike shed that after the talk. Uh, Daniel, did you want to ask a particular question? No, 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 go ahead. All right. Okay. I um, thought that we are finishing the presentation, but not yet. Okay. Ah, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one question is how much we want to interact with the Rust build system. So in my RFC, I use Cargo, which is what we usually use to build Rust projects. Uh, to build modules as static libraries, and then basically you LD add those uh, with the wrapper C object and that gets built into a module by the rest of the build system. It's okay. Um, it's going to get a bit ugly if the Rust code tries to use compiler intrinsics. Um, does that get us into GPL compatibility hell? I don't know why would it get it um I, so we have to be careful with stuff that we include in terms of um dependencies at the moment we have a dependency on um a c types library that's used in the binding generation that's mit licensed but there is if again like if we bypass the um the cargo thing then we've we've got a pretty we've got much more direct control over what gets linked in um so yeah i i suspect the way we want to go is to do the same sort of thing that rust for linux is doing uh and then you know they are building bits of the rust standard library the core and alloc crates into the kernel so i assume that they've thought about how that works um, some of these are sort of largely sort of technically and blank sheddy. One thing which maybe we want to address is how we we deal with this allocation failure through to panicking. Um, so Rust for Linux, I think, has introduced like failable alex. So rather than having your say you're creating a vector, rather than assuming that the vector creation will succeed or pushing an element to a vector, rather than assuming that that will succeed, uh, it returns a result type, which you then have to check. Maybe we want to do this and maybe we don't. Maybe like, um, a, an example where this would bite us, for example, is currently we have a bunch of image parsers in Grub. So, for example, if you try and parse a PNG that has a bajillion pixels in it, uh, we will parse the header, we will go, okay, you've asked for a bajillion pixels, we will try and allocate storage for a billion pixels, and that will fail. And then we will say, okay, we can't load that image. And that's probably a situation where we don't want to panic. Um, but on the other hand, the, like, we could fix this with Rust, or we could just say, Maybe let's not allow people to load very large so, images. So that, that that's that's an improvement on the status quo, though, which those are good. But <laughs> those are good, and, and obviously, what you're talking about is an improvement on the status quo in general. But right now, if we just made it so that so that if we, we take it like it, like it is and make it so that panics on all allocation failures, we've got the same behaviors we've already got. Well, yes and no, right? Because if you try and load an image that is too large, the allocation will fail. And Rust, a grub will just keep going. Um, yeah, okay, I see. Whereas the panic will kill Rust. And that seems suboptimal. 
Um, yeah, yes, I agree. I agree. Yeah. With you. <laughs> we should not kill a, kill a grub in such a case, I think. <laughs> so either we have to be quite cautious about how we write things that make assumptions about allocations or borrow however Rust for Linux does it um, because Linux is really anti things panicking. Uh, surprise, surprise. Um, I wanted also, so I mentioned the preprocessor macros before, so we do a lot of that. Um, so for example, and we don't do this so much anymore because we build all our modules in for secure boot, but once upon a time, um, you would build in no, almost no modules. You would create this command.list file based on uh, calls to, that basically we'd grab all of our files, pre-process them into a giant file, um, look for things like register command and do shell magic to create this list of commands and their relevant modules. And then we'd have a shim that would say, oh, you've tried to invoke this command that's in this module that we haven't loaded. I will load the module. I will replace my shim with the true command and then we'll invoke the true command. Um, we don't use the C preprocessor in Rust. Uh, so we could maybe proc macros in Rust, which is not a thing I understand very well but maybe we should just enumerate them explicitly. Um, Miguel, did you want to say something? Yeah, hey Daniel, thanks for, the, thanks for being brave uh, doing this. Uh, on the alloc, uh, just to clarify, even if you choose to go for uh, valuable allocation or invaluable allocations, uh, you can also keep both and choose, depending on which instance, you can have both as well. Because what we basically did was, well, for the kernel, we disallowed all the infallible ones. But that's because yeah. we disallowed them. But uh, other projects can actually pick at the point of use whether they want one or the other. So you, you can have okay. the default that you prefer. And uh, yeah, so just, you, you pick on uh, whatever you prefer. Yeah, that's all. That's good. Yeah, thank you. Um, one of the things that I think is so licensing, one of the things that I want to think, want us to think about as a community with licensing, and I'm cognizant that I'm running out of time, so I will not belabor this. Um, Rust for Linux has done some of the things that we will need to do. So for example, um, when you're doing bindings, you need to tell Rust uh, what the mapping is between a C type and a Rust type. And that's done with this thing called C-types. Uh, there is a community C-type module. It is, I believe, MIT licensed. It has very good platform support. Um, but as if we move away from cargo, this gets more complicated. Maybe we don't want to include MIT stuff. Um, Rust for Linux has got its own C-types library. But because it is written for the kernel, it's all licensed as GPLv2, and we are all licensed as GPLv3. Plus, uh, now the number of people who have contributed to this file and similar sorts of files is still fairly small. And I, sus I believe there's probably a willingness to relicense it, but I'm less comfortable asking the Rust for Linux people to do a FSF copyright assignment I'm not sure if we're still doing that for Grub. Um, so that might be something that we need to, like, maybe we're happy just pulling in some things from the community under an MIT license. Maybe we're um, just going to accept that we're going to have to do it ourselves. I don't know what our position on these sorts of things are in, in fine detail. Um, and that was all of the questions that I had. I apologize that this has taken so much of the, the half hour to talk about. Um, I don't know if we've got a couple of minutes before the next session is due to start, if anyone wants to pipe up with particular thoughts. I will tell at, at the beginning as a grab my turn that uh, for sure I want uh, Rust support in grab 
and I think that uh, your approach, uh, yes, uh, at, at, at this point uh, looks quite good. Of course, we have to solve uh, a lot of problems which you brought up in the presentation, but I think that uh, I'm happy to start the discussion and to solve, to try to solve all of them. Uh, to be honest, uh, I hope that I will not be killed by many people. But uh, to be honest, at this point, this is not uh, the highest priority for me because uh, uh, I try to recover from uh, uh, the backlog which is on Grab the Well. This is the most important thing for me. But uh, I can assure you that I want to uh, um, make this part at probably not in the, in the upcoming release, but in the next release. I, I, I think that it should be a part of of a graph. So from my side, uh, I, I'm not familiar with Rust, so I'm not able to tell uh, much about it. Uh, a few things which I spotted, are, uh, one question is about the size of, of, of the modules, what is the overhead when you use Rust to generate the modules, I think this is quite important. And more, the, this question is more important, I think, than, in, uh, than uh, for Kernel. And another thing is uh, national, uh, internationalization. Uh, because, um, as far as I can tell, a lot of people translate uh, messages uh, from the sea, and uh, I haven't seen any uh, nationalization macros in in their in your Rust examples. Maybe you didn't care, but uh, I'm not sure it is it is easy to introduce them or, or not. So the um, Rust hello module for uh, oh, that's not for XA6 CFI. That's for the EMU one. Let me see what it is for XA6 CFI. Um, the Rust Hello module is 12K. Um, that's compiled with Grub's LTO, but that's also compiled with the core and the alloc crates built in. And if we move those into the Grub kernel, um, rather than building them into each module, each module will be smaller. Um, okay. So uh, as for internationalization, I have not looked at all. Uh, I will make a note. Um, Russ, yeah, I don't know. I have absolutely no idea. So let's find out. No problem. Uh, no worries. Yeah, yeah. I I also agree. This is not the um, the highest priority for the Grub project in the short run. And there's obviously a lot of code that uh, my employer would like to get into Grub uh, before <laughs> it wants Russ to get into Grub. Uh, but I think yeah, it is. And it, it, it's also not ready to land just yet. It needs um, it needs us to bike shed how we're going to do allocations and how we're going to build the modules. Uh, but it is great to to have you on board with the, the overall idea. And any other questions for Daniel's presentation? Peter, go ahead. Isn't isn't our biggest issue really the thing about about having Itanium support and having to implement everything twice? Yeah. So the thing is, so for me, the the driving motivation for for this is that we have so many. Like Grub does a lot of stuff, like a PNG parser and an HTTP client, um, and it would be really nice to be able to optionally move those to, or file system parsers, to optionally move those to safer languages. I'm not proposing to implement new features in Rust. And I, the, yeah, I, I just want to make the low hanging fruit for memory and safety less bad. And I think for that, I'm happy if we just keep having multiple, um, like a C version and a, a non-C version. A Rust version. Okay, Jordan, uh, you have a question for Daniel, I think. Hi. Uh, so, I have sort of have been following the Grub project a lot, uh, but never really enough to want to learn Grub's build system. Uh, I'd love to try to write a small uh, Grub module in Rust. I uh, when I was looking at your patch, it was hard for me to see which parts were adding Rust support and which parts were just, you know, adding your hello module. Um, if I could see that separated out or a blog of here's how to 
write just the grub module yeah. now that we've got the infrastructure that'd be helpful for me sure um that's very fair it the grub i have a complicated relation i have complicated feelings about the grub build system uh <laughs> the <laughs> not only uh, like there is one problem I need to fix before that, which is that the Grub version that I was building with, the Rust version that I was building with is inserting this uh, stack probing symbol uh, in every module. Uh, and that makes, um, uh, that means that the module verifier says the simplest to find in multiple modules and fails out. Uh, I want to, it, it, this is not a problem, by the way, if you're compiling for PowerPC. Uh, so I, I do want to solve that problem uh, because that means that currently you can only build one Rust module uh, at a time, which is obviously suboptimal. Um, once I sort that out, uh, I think, yeah, making it really clear to people how to experiment with Rust modules uh, is probably very helpful. Uh, and we will wind it up there. Okay, we have one more minute. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Daniel, uh, for taking a stop uh, for this. I'm, as I said, I'm very happy that you uh, did it. And uh, as I said, uh, I'm happy to continue work on, on this. Uh, but uh, we have, uh, uh, before that, we have other things to solve that are quite important, I, I think, memory allocator. So once again, for working on these issues, it, it is very important for me. And thank you for joining for, uh, to us, because uh, as far as I can tell, this is quite late for you. Yes, it, it is uh, quarter to one in the morning now, but uh, <laughs> at, least it, <laughs> at least it's not Friday. That would have been very brutal. <laughs> Sorry about uh, that. My, okay. my my colleagues and I want to run a, a um, LPC APAC, so we'll see how we go with that anyway. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. I made you a presenter and we'll start in minutes.
Okay. So I would like to welcome Alec Brown from Oracle, uh, who will be presenting firmware and bootloader uh, specification, which we are discussing for some time, some delays. But I hope that we'll speed up uh, the discussion right now. So over to you, Alec. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, so, I'm Alec, uh, a software developer at Oracle, um, and we've been recently working on the development of a specification for some firmware and bootloader logging. Uh, to make things a little bit easier, I'd ask uh, if you save questions till after I get to the presentation, it, 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 it'd make things a little bit easier. Uh, and if you do have questions, uh, write them down, we can get back to them after. Uh, so, to begin with, uh, well, before I get into the background, the main goal of this specification was to develop a uh, logging system to allow for various boot components to send uh, their logs to the OS so users can read them after they've uh, run their course on the boot chain. So, a little bit of background on the project. Uh, we needed more information for uh, how the platform was set up during boot for the trench boot project. So we started some development, I believe last year on an early version of the logs for specifically the grub bootloader. And after some discussion, we found that, okay, this can be extended to uh, firmware or shim logs and we can uh, make it a little more generic for other environments. So we will get into some of the proposals we had. Uh, so we came up with three different structures on how we think we could uh, store these logs. On the left side, we have a log header, which will be used as a link list to connect all the log buffers that are generated by the various boot components. And on the right side, we have a specific logging format that can be used for this. In this case, we're calling it this, the BF log format. Uh, we'll be probably using this for the grub bootloader, uh, but it's not, a, it's not a requirement that uh, boot components have to use this. There will be various log formats that a uh, boot component can use, such as the core boot CBMM console. Uh, that will be a little bit more useful for firmware as it could be, as it's a little more lightweight than our proposal. So I'll jump into the BF log header structure and talk about that. Uh, so for this structure, we have eight different fields that we are having it, that's in it. Uh, first, which is the version for the log header. Uh, so if we make changes to the log header structure in the future, uh, we could just update this number. Then we also have a size field. So this is how, how much memory this uh, log structure is taking, uh, allow for backward compatibility uh, if other fields are added. Then we have the producer. So who is generating the log messages? Is it the firmware? Is it the bootloader? Uh, this is a null terminated string and it, the length allows for ASCII UUID storage. After that, we have the log format field. Uh, this is, explains which format is being used to record the logs. As I said before, it could be the BF log format. It could be CVM uh, console, could be something else. Uh, various producers are allowed to not just stick with one logging format, they can use multiple uh, different formats if they need it. So that's a null terminate string. And then we have the flags field from there, which is a bit field for storing information on the log state. Uh, we currently have bit zero as if the log has been truncated. We're, we're still trying to discuss on what other flags will be useful to include in this field. Continuing, uh, we have the next BF log header address. This is uh, this what makes this, it uh, the structure a linked list. So it's a physical address pointing to the next BF log header structure in the chain. So the the first element of this linked list would probably be the latest boot component in the boot chain. So what comes right before the OS, and then the last one will be what starts the boot chain, so probably the firmware. And then since there's nothing that comes before that, <laughs> we'll have it set to zero, uh, making it the end of it. And then 
we have the log address field, which is quite important because we need to be able to point to where the log buffer is being stored in memory. So we have that. And then after that, we have the log size field because we need to know how much memory to read in order to obtain the, the log buffer. So now we're going to jump into our BF log format structures. So first of which is the BF log buffer. This is the header for all the the log messages consist of five different fields. First of being version. So if we make changes to the log messages structures or this log buffer structure, we'd update that. Then we have the size field. So how much allocated space is being used by not only the BF log buffer, but all of the messages stored in the messages field. Uh, this way we can allocate it all together in one spot. Then we have a kind of a duplicate of the BF log headers producer field. Uh, the reason we're duplicating uh, the producer field is because we want this to be independent of BF log header. So we can detach it and still have all the useful information for reading this, but it doesn't, we don't need to rely on BF log header as much. And next we have the next message offset. So it's a byte offset from the beginning of this structure all the way to the next available byte within the messages field. So as we're storing more messages, we'll increase this byte offset and, and then uh, we know where to put the next messages as they come in. And then lastly, we have the array of log messages uh, stored in the BF log message structure. Now for each individual message, that will be stored, we have the BF log message structure. So this consists of seven fields, and first of which being the size, so how much space this uh, uh, log message entry takes up. Then we have the timestamp in nanoseconds, so when the message was sent by the producer, and the producer would define what it believes the meaning of zero would be for this log format. Next, we have the level field. So it's similar to syslog in that it is used to differentiate normal logs from debug log messages. And this is up for producer interpretation, as well as uh, facility, uh, which is also similar to syslog meaning and is used to differentiate the sources of the log messages and where they're coming from within the producer. Uh, continuing, we have uh, the message offset field. So this will be used to specify where message is starting in the structure because the type field isn't determined at how big it is. So we don't know when the message field would necessarily start. So we have to specify, okay, which byte in the structure is it starting at? So that's what the message offset fields for. Then we have the type field, which is the log message type. And it's similar to facility, but this is a null terminate string instead of an integer. Uh, now it's the case that the producer can use either type, level, facility, or any combination, or it doesn't have to. Uh, so if that's the case, it can set level and facility to zero, or it can set type to an empty null terminate string. That's up for the producer to decide. And then lastly, we have, of course, <laughs> what we're storing, which is the log message, which is a null terminate string. Uh, so an example on how we got this set up on the grub last year, um, we were had it so that the log, the logs would be read directly from the grub printf functions and then stored in a temporary buffer, which would then get dynamically reallocated. And once this has happened, uh, the log would be copied to a final spot uh, in memory and then passed to the Linux kernel through some boot parameters, where then the user would be able to parse it using parsing tools after it's been exposed. Uh, within the bootloader, we had a couple of environmental variables to be able to control uh, the usage of the log. So we had the grub log environmental variable, which would turn on and off the log if it wants to record or not. Then the grub log debug variable, which would allow for debug messages to be recorded. And then the grub log debug FL variable, which would allow for file and line numbers to be recorded in the debug messages. Uh, here were some of the changes we needed to make for the Linux kernel uh, in the boot parameters. So we had to add a 
bootloader log address uh, parameter, as well as the log size, because we need to know how much we're reading. So those are some of the changes we need to make to make the log work in that scenario. Now, uh, some, some uh, topics for discussion is the specification placement. We're not entirely sure where to put it. We could make it uh, a part of an existing uh, specification, such as in UEFI, ACPI, or Multiboot 2, or we can make it standalone in the case of OASIS standards. So this is up for uh, discussion, uh, along with uh, how we're going to pass the log to the OS. Uh, we could either, well, on UEFI platforms, we can use configuration tables to pass the log. So once we pass the log to the config table, the Linux kernel would look through the config table and and then it would expose it uh, through the a file path such as the one um, shown on the slides. In the case of ACPI and device tree platforms, we could um, expose it using the next log address field in the BF log header to pass the log. If none of these uh, if none of these scenarios are on the platform uh, or none of these platforms are being used. Uh, then it comes a little bit trickier, but uh, platforms that don't use UEFI, ACPI, or device trees are coming less common, so uh, that shouldn't be too much of an issue. Uh, so some previous discussions, uh, we have links to them here you can find in the slides. We also made a couple of patches to the Grub to allow it for bootloader support and Linux kernel to allow for bootloader log support. We also created a uh, log parser known as SLstat tool, which would be useful. Now, a uh, couple uh, questions that we do have for discussion that I don't have in the slides currently um, is if you think that it would be better to for these logs to be targeted for a specific uh, let's see, for a specific yeah target format so like if it's, if it should specify for specific uh, boot component or something like that. This would make it less bloated. However, we could also just make it more generic and this would make it a little bit more flexible. Or we could, uh, another case uh, is how we want to pass the logs to the, the OS. Uh, if we should pass them all together or if they should, if we think that it's just leave it and have each log or each type of log format, pass it on their own. Um, so those are some things that were also for discussion um, based on some of the comments we've already received. So uh, I'll open up for questions if anybody has any. Hi, I have a basic question. So I'm yes. trying to understand the, how do I compare this uh, new log mechanism with the there's already TPM firmware logs in which you measure the boot chain and the config data also, and as part of measured boot. Uh, so does it, how does it differentiate with that? And second thing is, it seems to me more like something what syslog is, so, but containing all the components from. Uh, yes, um, the, the log for TPM is completely different thing than, than the thing which are proposing. Uh, the log uh, uh, buffer which we are uh, which we are proposing here is to store messages uh, from the events which are happening during, uh, for example, firmware startup or uh, uh, bootloader, a uh, boot, uh, bootloader initialization or memorial location, etc. Et so this way you would be able uh, to uh, to get uh, from this uh, to get information from this log what were happening during the firmware. Uh, and uh, the firmware uh, runtime and uh, the bootloader runtime. This is not targeted for uh, system measurement or something like that. This is just to store the information. Like, uh, uh, like you said, uh, we can compare it to the syslog uh, 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 thing. So Let's then the, uh, sorry. Go ahead, sorry. The, the ownership is stacked, so the log gets created starting at the firmware, and then the ownership gets transferred at every layer so that every layer can update and modify. Excuse me, I, I'm not sure I understand the, the, the question. So the log actually starts when the firmware starts. Uh, they update it, and then they pass to the next layer, boot lo bootloader, 
and the bootloader passes to the OS, and each layer has an ability to keep modifying the log or updating the. Uh, the idea is uh, 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 that uh, every uh, component in the uh, in the uh, system creates own log. Uh, Potentially, of course, you, you can, uh, for example, you have a few more which creates a log and after that passes the control to the, uh, to the bootloader and then uh, uh, the bootloader attaches uh, uh, own messages to the, to the, the same uh, log buffer. But I think this is not the, uh, the best solution. Uh, we think that every uh, component in uh, every component in the boot chain should, uh, should create own log and attach it to the uh, buffer log uh, header uh, and in this way create the list of logs uh, which were produced by uh, which were produced by var various boot components i think that this is a better better solution okay yes i think i'm trying to understand exactly what how it okay, is no worries no problem thank you we are welcome any other questions suggestions you mentioned I, mean, I guess regarding to oh. you, Stuart. <laughs> I was going to say, um, you know, regarding the question about, you know, who passes these to the OS, I mean, I, I think it's going to have to come from one entity because like on ARM systems, there's going to be several layers of firmware, you know, before you even get to UEFI, for example, trusted firmware, perhaps secure world firmware. And so if all of these create logs, um, I mean, they're not going to have any way to pass them to the OS, for example. And so I think, you know, they need to pass them to the next component in the boot chain. And eventually, they're all gathered together and passed to the OS. Um, so I, I think to that question, I, I think, yeah, you need you need some way of having one entity pass everything that's collected. Yes, yes that is why we are thinking about various solutions. As, uh, as Alex said during his presentation, we are considering EFI, but uh, we also have uh, non UFI platforms, so we are thinking about yeah. ICKI and other platforms. Uh, but as you said, uh, each component uh, uh, should pass in uh, in our design. Each component, uh, uh, lower component, should pass uh, uh, to higher level or, uh, logs produced by ourselves, and also logs produced by uh, by earlier uh, stages. So this way, it will be easy to pass all the logs just pointing to one structure. Uh, right. uh, it is, I think it is much easier than uh, inventing new uh, mechanism to pass every log from every, uh, every stage right. in the system. Yeah, that's, this, my, this... Yeah, that's kind of my key point. <clears throat> okay, thanks a lot. Uh, we ahead. get some com Sorry, Mark, uh, sorry. No, you, I'll let you finish first. <laughs> Okay, so go ahead. Okay, I was going to say for x86, you mentioned putting stuff in the header and then you mentioned the PFI case, uh, discovering this for a system table. You mentioned somehow that was going to be discovered for device tree and ACPI. Um, I was going to say on ARM64 on, on, on Linux, if you want to, if you're trying to support that, um, we obviously don't uh, patch the image header at all. So the only mechanisms we have for discovering things are through PFI system tables or something placed in device tree. But I think as um, Stuart mentioned, we've got a load of boot agents that run before that. Um, and also we don't necessarily have like a device tree own, we don't know that a system might not have a device tree until the bootloader creates it immediately as part of the ARM64 Linux boot protocol. Um, so we don't necessarily have a consistent location in which to identify the presence of this table throughout the lifetime, even of a single boot. Um, so this probably requires a fair amount more thought as to how that's expected to be transferred and discovered at each layer, because the mechanism might not be the same between, say, TFA and GROB, sorry, TFA and EDK2, then EDK2 and GROB, and then GROB and Linux and so on and so forth. Okay, I understand uh, what you mean. Uh, I think that um, we should be able to specify how the uh, all how all logs are passed to the uh, operating system. I think that I agree that it will be difficult to specify how every uh, boot components passes uh, 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 the logs from one to another uh, stage. Uh, but I think that we should at least try to specify how uh, uh, different mechanisms in, in different uh, uh, 
platforms are used to pass, uh, let's say, bootloader lock uh, from the grab to the operating system. And that is why we, we, uh, we propose that is the UFI solution. But I think that we should have uh, various alternatives depending on what kind of, of system we are using. So I think having a single way to do things is, is nice and all, but there are like, existing ways in which this information passed, for example, for TFA, so where we don't necessarily have the facility to grab that information. So there is also going to have to be working with those existing standards as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, Peter, I think that you had a question. Yeah, but I think actually Mark covered it all. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Um, I think that I have, a, to some extent, I have a feeling from the discussion on the mailing is that some people think that uh, it is not worth making a such standard because I heard, for example, that uh, our pro buffer lock proposal is uh, a bit bloated. But from my, I, after some thinking, uh, I think that we have two sol solutions. Alec also was mentioned uh, this, that uh, uh, we can make something generic, which can be used by uh, uh, various uh, uh, various boot components. And this way, of course, it will be to some extent uh, uh, bloated. But uh, on the other hand, we are able to use one standard and also create one tool which is able to parse various logs from uh, uh, boot components. So you don't need to uh, create uh, a specific tool for uh, each component. Uh, on the other hand, if you do not like this solution, I think that we can go into something which is more, more targeted for various input components. For example, Grab will use own uh, format to pass uh, log, uh, uh, logs uh, 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 and, uh, other, for example, and the core boot will create uh, uh, logs in, in different formats. So I think this is important question uh, before we continue to reply to this question before we continue the work on, on this. Of course, Alec will be replying to all these questions and I think we'll continue the discussion. But if you have some suggestions right now, we are happy to hear that. Yes, one other comment is, I mean, I have heard some discussions around this in the context of BMCs. So, you know, you have a server system with a BMC in some cases, there's ways the BMC, you know, which is going to does management functions, can collect logging and boot status and boot status codes. And I don't know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure where those discussions stand as far as like, say, for ARM, you know, trusted firmware logs being accessible by a BMC. But it seems like some of the same problems might exist. And so I don't know, it's probably worth just understanding whether or not there's any current BMC related. Um, you know, log collection um, mechanisms that, you know, either may exist or being worked on by, you know, people in that community, like maybe open BMC or something like that. But just, just a thought that it's another place where um, logs might be useful. Okay, makes sense for me. Uh, Stuart, could you, could you uh, give us some contacts for the people, to the people who are working on a uh, uh, similar thing from BMC? Yeah, let me, there's someone I know who, uh, let me just see if he knows, and I could kind of, uh, I could let you guys know. Okay, I, I don't know okay. right this minute, but, um, okay. No worries, you can send me an email. Yeah. Any other questions, complaints, <laughs> suggestions? Okay, I think that we are done. Mm. Hi, James, sorry. James, go ahead. I was just going to ask the obvious one about uh, logs that we actually want to be attested versus logs that we don't. Are we going to try and split the log format to do that? Because obviously there are things that we would like to see in the boot log. And to do that, you're gonna to have to be in the TCG log format. Mm, I don't I mean, we do it by verifiers but we could do it via the logging system as well. I'm not sure I understand the question. 
But the, the ob it's not a question, it's an observation. There are certain pieces of the grub log that are important to the security terms. And those okay. important pieces should be verified, I think, through the TPM if you're doing measured boot. So okay. are we going to have a way of routing the log into the TPM boot log? Uh, uh, we didn't consider that, but I think that this is a very good suggestion. I think that it shouldn't be very difficult to uh, introduce such mechanism into the grab. I think that we can do in similar way uh, which we did for this uh, logic mechanism. So I think it shouldn't be very difficult. It requires, uh, Alec added the code which uh, does this logging. I think it doesn't require more than 100 lines or something like that. So it shouldn't be difficult to do measurements of some uh, locks from the graph, I think. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So I, I believe I, I missed some, some piece since we still have time left, right? Um, I believe I, I missed some piece on, on why, why are we trying to boil the ocean? Like, do we really have any platform out there that is not UEFI that you care about? May, maybe some BIOS platforms on, on a VM, sure. Make, make a one off there, but do you have something that doesn't deal with um, basically GUIDs that tell you I am table X, Y, Z, and then you just ingest all of these tables, and every time you find identifier X, which means I, I'm a grub lock file, you just expose them using sysfs. So to do, do you suggest that we should just care about UEFI stuff only? Uh, I think that Piotr uh, could say more about that because he, is work, he works on um, uh, firmware walls and I think uh, he can say something about that. Yeah, so uh, currently like market share of laptops is 10% Chromebooks. All of them are core boot. Core boot has its own mechanism to, to transmit um, arbitrary data from, from uh, core boot into the US, right? Yes, but core boot also may want to use uh, grab based uh, booting. So why why grab should not support uh, core boot mechanism or or just agree with core boot community how to lay out the login format? Sure. Again, again, it's about boiling the ocean. Um, if if there is a core boot um, incentive to to implement that, then we can literally just shove it into CBFS, can't we? Uh, in general, uh, and boot, sorry. right now there there is already mechanism. There is CBMM, and uh, if you look at the thread uh, where this uh, RFC version three is discussed, uh, Julius Warner uh, from Google, his his Chromium firmware maintainer, uh, already kind of uh, pointed his uh, his opinion about that. So, and and I believe Daniel re uh, repeating his opinion that this uh, this spec is bloated. And, and he's got a couple other points, um, like precisely saying what's going on uh, around the spec and why maybe they don't exactly like it. So, okay, so, so there is interest from the core boot community. This is not like they do not participate in. If I'm looking at the replies, I see for the version three, I see uh, three replies and two coming from uh, from uh, open source firmware community from Corbett community. Okay. I, uh, what I'm hearing is you could very easily get away with a um, firmware specific backend that just propagates a standardized file format that is grub specific or maybe even just plain text digitally. I don't think you need anything more than plain text in, in, in this case of what I what I read, uh, what, what I saw here. Um, you could pass that using a firmware specific mechanism such as UEFI table, or if you are not sure what you want to do for a bio system, maybe you just literally do, ask the ACPI consortium whether you can reserve one table format and then just make it a table, a literal ACPI table um, that just happens to contain plain text. Uh, and for, for, um, for core boot, again, like whether it's CBMM or CBFS or whatever other native mechanism the core boot people have uh, and, and, and consider on both um, is, is an implementation detail. But it's, it's like, 
just use whatever your, your firmware mechanism has and, and make the rest on top of it as easy as possible. Put an identifier, make, make it a generic mechanism that just says this is a plain text file. Put an identifier on top that says I come from Grub so that somebody else can say I come from some other component in my boot chain and you basically solve 99% of the problem with like super, super simple modifications. So uh, you suggest that we should simplify the the structure which is used to pass to, uh, uh, logs from one state to another, right? This is my understand. I understand correctly. I, I, I'm saying use use the firmware native mechanisms you have okay. to just um, to just own a particular grub thing and just open the door for others to implement their own, but don't don't do their work for them. Okay. As long, so as, long as your I, I, format, as long as you just reserve a GUID or a, a identifier, and you just make sure that you have another identifier that says I come from Grub, and then everything beyond that is just Grub native and Grub proprietary, whatever. Well, it's not proprietary in open source world. Um, Grub specific okay. uh, data. Um, you basically set, and then you don't have to go and coordinate with every single entity that is out there. But you still have a mechanism that allows other film pre pre boot firmware pieces to also pass information because you can have five of those tables if you really want to. Okay. Daniel, uh, can you can you kind of um, explain like the underlying problem uh, that that you're trying to solve? Because that's uh, I believe like that's probably something that was solved, or or we just there, trying there, to there, unify. There, there are currently, as Alex said at the beginning of his presentation, uh, the idea of this uh, log uh, was uh, was created. Let's say. Uh, when we started work on the, the Transboot project and uh, we wanted to know how the platform was initialized before uh, before running uh, the Emily. So that is why we wanted to know what was happening in, in the graph. And after, think, after some thinking, we uh, realized that maybe it makes more sense to prepare something which is not Transboot uh, not strange but specific, but uh, more generic and can be used by, uh, by by others. I am aware that we cannot create something which uh, uh, will uh, fit all sizes. Okay, I agree that, for example, uh, for Cobut, this uh, format in in current state is not usable because it is too heavy. That is why we decided to split this in two parts. One one part which allows us to link all logs in, in, into the list, list and point the uh, uh, and to have one one let's say let's let's call it one handle to the all logs and another part of this maybe it is not clear for our uh, maybe it is not clear for our email in, from from the presentation maybe it is our fault another part is uh, think which specifies format which can be used to store uh, uh, logs about what is happening in, in uh, a given boot, compo uh, boot component. I th and, and I think that we should uh, split these two things. So I agree, so, with, Ale I, I agree but, with Alex that we should use as much as possible existing mechanism to pass the information about logs. Uh, for and uh, I think that UFI uh, config tables are, uh, are uh, is good example. Uh, Alex, do you agree with me? So, so uh, fu fundamentally, the only problem we actually need to solve is being able to, to pass things up from the rear parts of the stack to the kernel, and have them in an identifiable order. Okay, that's the only problem we have to solve. Everything after that is stuff we we want to solve, and we can solve piecemeal. But we need to make sure that, that we understand how to put them together once we've solved them individually piecemeal, right? Okay. Yeah, and, and James, James mentioned the TCG uh, uh, TPM event log. And I believe this kind of sounds like it uh, fills the need because if the measurements of the, of the stages uh, are, are there, and then, uh, then we can figure out based on the event log that what happened before. Of course, this has to be reasonably trusted, and that's that that trustworthy, and that could be some problem. Okay. 
Okay, uh, we are running out of time. Uh, no, thank you for, uh, for your discussion. I think that if you have some concerns, uh, complaints or ideas how to solve, uh, how to solve this, uh, your comments are welcome on the mailing list. I hope that we'll speed up, uh, speed up this, the work on this and um, will not apply after, after a year. Uh, for, for, for the questions. So, Alec, once again for your presentation, and uh, we'll be replying for questions on the email, uh, I think, by the end of next week. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. See you. Yeah. We'll start next presentation in five minutes. Mr. Stewart, you are presented right now, and we'll start in four minutes. Just a reminder, uh, I would like to uh, make you aware that we have one and a half hour uh, uh, free for discussion uh, after the presentation. So feel free to propose some topics to discuss and we can schedule them.
Okay, let's get started. I would like to welcome Stuart. Stuart is working for RAM and he will be presenting Linux and DRTM on ARM. Over to you, Stuart. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, everyone. I'm Stuart Yoder from ARM and I'm a system architect and have been working on um, DRTM on ARM. And so you know, there's been some demand for that from some of our partners and so I've been over the last year or so working on uh, working on architecture and so we're, we're getting at the point where um, we're gonna have a beta spec soon that'll be public and so there's a there's a few questions I just like to discuss that you know impact Linux and so that's kind of what we're gonna talk about so I'm gonna start probably spend five ten minutes just on um, just one, like what is DRTM is just a very quick summary of like, just to kind of get to the essence of what DRTM is trying to, to get at and then show how that maps on ARM and kind of what our basic uh, strategy is for how we're gonna do it, um, how it maps onto the ARM privilege levels and so on. And then there's several kind of questions um, I'd like to discussion points uh, to, to talk about after that. So that, I guess let's start. So, um, so a DRTM, just at a high level, uh, the essence of it is that, you know, you are, you have one component, maybe it's a bootloader that wants to launch or start another component, for example, an operating system. And so you have this handoff from, from one to the other. And the, the typical way that you have security and, and you, you can ensure the integrity and authenticity of your OS kernel is, for example, doing a signature validation check um, using digital signatures or perhaps measuring it into a TPM. And so, but in that, in that scenario, you're relying on the boot component to be trustworthy, to be able to make that measurement or make that verification check. And so the way we typically um, deal with that is a boot chain where you start in an immutable route of trust, you go through stages of boot where each stage verifies the next, and you know, eventually you get to um, your, your OS kernel. Um, but I guess what, what happens is you're, you're really relying on that each stage of this boot chain has integrity and there's, there hasn't been a bug that compromised the, you know, your verified boot flow and so on. And especially with something like UEFI, which is arbitrarily extensible, um, in spite of the fact that it has secure boot and verifies you know, all loaded drivers and so on, there's just still, the, the bigger this chain gets, the harder it is to rationalize um, that there hasn't been a compromise somewhere. And so, so, you know, getting back to our boot component wanting to launch the target image, what DRTM gives you is the ability to, to have a higher privileged um, root of trust that verifies or actually measures your target image before executing it. So that's what we call a dynamic launch. And so you're going to initiate a dynamic launch. Um, you'll have to take a measurement of your target image into to the TPM and then you transfer control to your target image. And so then with that measurement, that OS kernel or whatever it is, hypervisor, can then enforce a security policy around that measurement. If that measurement isn't correct, um, like what was expected, then you could either halt boot or, or do whatever remediation is necessary. Um, so that's the, that's the gist of it. Um, you could also, it's not, it's not necessarily just from boot to OS, you could have you know one OS image start another one. So like for example, kind of like a K exec. And so this is not a boot time only um, mechanism. So how do we map this one to ARM? Um, actually, sorry, one other thing. So the other thing that DRTM gives you is some some, some security guarantees. And so here, um, basically, what DRTM guarantees is that you have a trustworthy measurement of your target image and that when you start executing it, you're in a safe state. There's a single thread of execution on the system. There's no interrupts enabled. There's DMA protections in place that, that can guarantee you're not being um, you know, under a DMA attack. And that also there's some data provided by DRTM so that you know what your physical memory map is. There's some security critical ACPI tables that you know, is, are provided as well. So, you, you start in a safe place, essentially, and then that, that OS kernel can, can go from there um, as it kind of builds a new TCB. So mapping this onto ARM. So on ARM, there's, um, 
like ARMv8, 64-bit architecture, has four privilege levels. Um, and there's a secure and non-secure um, division there. So you, so on the secure side of an ARM machine, you have you have this secure firmware at EL3, and the potentially secure OSs that offer secure services. Um, and then it's in the non-secure world where, you know, like Linux and um, your normal application type um, OSs work. And so the scope of DRTM on ARM is, is about the non-secure side of the machine. So we're not trying to um, relaunch you know, every, everything, um, but it's, uh, it's how in the, in the non-secure world um, can you launch your, your hypervisor OS kernel securely. And so what that looks like um, is shown in this flow here where, um, in this picture here, the, what I highlighted as, as the DC preamble, which is where things start, is is this is a is kind of, is your component that wants to launch the target OS kernel, and so that in this example is at, is at EL2, and so an example might be wanting to start you know, Linux or Trench Boot, um, and then the DRTM implementation begins in our EL3 firmware, and so um, so that's where things start and so so one implementation is that essentially our our secure firmware is the root of trust on x86 you know the the dynamic launch happens via special instructions but on arm it's going to be via an smc call that transitions to the secure firmware and then it can start from there we are also are allowing um in the architecture we allow for an implementation where you start in the same way, but that the actual root of trust is in a separate security coprocessor. So, so there's a firmware backed DRTM flow, which where your root of trust is your secure firmware. And then there will also be a hardware backed flow allowed um, where your root of trust is a security coprocessor. And so there are you know, basically three phases where you, know, you start here um, with what we call the DC preamble and then you do your dynamic launch, transition to your implementation, whether it's in firmware or in a security coprocessor, and then you can continue with a part of the um, DRTM firmware, like at EL2, and then from there to your target image, which we call the DLME. So it, it's a pretty simple, um, you know, conceptually pretty simple flow that you know where you start, you initiate the, the launch, and then you arrive at your target image and go from there. Um, so that's the that's the quick overview of you know what DRTM is and how, and how we see it mapping on the ARM. Um, I guess I guess uh, maybe a pause for any questions there before we jump into some of the discussion points. Okay. Okay. So there's. Uh, several yeah what what are what are dce dlme i, I know what like so crtm is is probably the the like constant root of trust i suppose yeah but... it's um dce stands for dynamic configuration environment it's basically just a secondary stage of the drtm firmware that um that that you know is going to measure the dlme and and start you know which then starts the os um so it, it's the deal on me, the dynamic launch measured environment. That's the part that gets measured um, where, and where things start. So it's that code that starts in you know, that secure place. Uh, but the, the black boxes here, which we call the DCRTM and DC, are just, are just going to be you know, DRTM firmware components that um, are handling, you know, handling, making sure things are um, in a secure state, taking the measurements, and so on. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Why, why, why did you separate the DCRTM and DCE? Why, why did DCE? we what? Why, why did you separate the DCRTM and DCE? Um, okay, so, I mean, the main reason is is that you could really combine them, but there is just a principle that we like to follow in, in, in pushing out as much of our EL3 privilege level as possible, and so. That would be, you know, combining them at EL at, the, at EL three would be valid, but then um, it just 
you know, I guess what we're, what we're trying to do is minimize the framer at that privilege level. And so, you know, the, so this is an implementation. Um, this is not, what I'm showing here is like an example of how you could do it. Um, the architecture does not require it, but, um, but I think that's how we see it probably in our proof of concept or reference implementation that ARM's gonna, you know, will put out. Um, the current plan would be to do it like this, to split out as much as possible from EL3, just to minimize, you know, the- Okay, I, I, I understand, but, but uh, shouldn't the measurement of DLME happen in EL3? Uh, um, from from well, security point of view? Well, if you, you know, if in fact you are, you know, if you start at EL3 and if you measure and take and signature check the DCE and you're running on a single core, there's no DMA, um, I mean, it shouldn't be possible for the DCE to be compromised or attacked because, you know, okay. you are, you are measuring it and you're, we're, you're also requiring a signature check on it as well. And so since, you know, we were starting a small, you know, new boot chain here by with, with this extra component. Um, but so I, I, I guess in my view, you know, from a security point of view, you, you know, the DCE can safely measure the DLME because of, of the state of the machine. Okay. Makes sense for me. Thank you. <clears throat> so I guess, you know, what I wanted to discuss is, I mean, a couple of points about, um, one is the, this handoff um to the os and and so in this case linux um so one of the so one of the things we do is when, when you hand off to your target which you know say it's going to be trench boot or or linux is there's a set of data that we provide um i mean i think this is in line with what is done on x86 um there's I mean, so the things we provide are in this, are shown in this in the in the, di in the diagram here. There's a, a a list of what memory is DMA protected, so that you know the target image knows, like when it starts, it knows where the DMA protections are. There's also an address map of the system that shows you where um, you, you know where your physical memory regions are, so that you know you don't you're not relying on say a UEFI provided um, address map. There's also the event log from the DRTM events, um, and also a set of ACPI tables that we are deeming security critical. So um, where the SMMUs are on ARM, um, PCI config space, um, MADT for interrupt controllers. And so there's a small set of ACPI tables that are that are provided that you know DRTM guarantees are correct. And again, so you don't have to, you can replace the UEFI provided um, ACPI tables with these um, to kind of, you know, as you get started in bootstrap. Um, so I guess the one question I wanted to raise, a discussion point was around just what you know, whether there's, whether there's anything anyone sees here, especially from the trench boot Linux point of view that, um, you know, might be missing or is there anything, you know, that, that you, that you see here? I, I don't know today what trench boot does as far as, um, you know, using ACPI tables provided by, um, by TXT, um, or, you know, verifying the address map, but yeah, I just wanted to, you know, at least raise raise the question about this handoff to see if um, if anyone had any you know any points of discussion on that. Uh, I have a question: um, How your implementation is close to the TCG uh, specification, DLTM TCG specification? Uh, mm, because, for example, if you look at that uh, Intel specification, it, it is in some places it is completely different. Uh, one good example is uh, information how the uh, TPM log is passed. Uh, as far as I can tell, uh, in Intel implementation, it, it is passed in uh, uh, Intel own structures. But this specification says that uh, uh, DRTM uh, implementations should use a special table to pass information about the, the TCG. 
Uh, so the question is, uh, this, this is a good example of, of the yeah. differences. So how many differences in, is in your implementation in comparison to the DRTM? Um, I mean, I would just say we, we loosely, you know, you know, follow the, to follow the, you know, the conception, it basically conceptually follows that architecture, but when it comes to data structures and so on, we, we didn't, we didn't use that anything from there. So, so in this picture here, we, in this data set of data that gets passed, you know, we have a header that points to these different regions. And so in, in one region, we have the DR team event log, um, you know, we have a set of arm unique event types and so on that, you know, were needed, but, um, but we did, we didn't follow any data structures, uh, from, from the TCG spec. I mean, I guess it just didn't, it just didn't look like it was worth, um, doing. And, and also, like you were saying, it, it looks like existing implementations, DRTN did not follow that spec either. So we, we just did what we thought made sense rather than, you know, being, um, picky about following that spec because it didn't seem like there was much value. I mean, it was there wasn't like existing code that we're going to get to reuse by following that spec. So, so, so yeah, so we, we loosely followed it, but not down to the data structure level. This event log, you know, it is a standard TCG event log. Um, but yeah, you'll find it, the, the DLME will find it, you know, through this data header. Um, the other topics, kind of a, you know, a bigger topic that I, I don't think we're going to solve here, but I just want to raise it. Um, and th that's about UEFI runtime services. Um, so, so in this boot flow, you know, the one, the one thing that's, you know, is kind of missing with DRTM is that UEFI runtime services, which came from the previous stage of firmware is not measured, right? Um, we, we've measured you know, the DLME, the, 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 your target image, but UEFI runtime services is needed by the OS, but um, it's not measured or verified. And so, so one of the feedback from one of our partners, you know, who, who's done DRTM on x86 just says that, you know, he sees this as a, as a huge security hole in, um, in DRTM and that we, you know, there is gonna be unvalidated code unverified code that the OS depends on. Um, and so this is not an ARM issue. I mean, it, 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 it exists on x86. And so on, um, you know, on Windows, Microsoft addresses this by sandboxing DRT, uh, by sandboxing the runtime services at a, you know, lower privilege level along with, you know, their, with their, I mean, they have a hypervisor at the at the highest privilege level, and then other everything else, including the Windows kernel, is sandboxed at, at a lower privilege level, and so um, that's how they deal with it. But on for, for Linux, the question is, what do we do here? Um, I think you know I've discussed it with Art, and I mean, he mentioned um, PRM as as a maybe having a similar issue, and you know, is there a way we could run runtime services? You know, at a lower privilege level and sandbox it somehow like that, or I don't know. Where is there some way to measure it? You know, realistically, I mean, could we? The only thing I can think of there is maybe somehow split runtime services into a separate image that doesn't really get executed until the OS maybe initializes it or something like that. And so you you measure it. I, I'm not sure, but I just wanted to at least raise this question to see if anyone. Has thought about it um, or has any ideas that it's even at a high level about how we deal with this in a Linux environment. So to me, it thinks like it is a similar question to uh, what people on um, OSFW Slack dealing with uh, about how to separate um, runtime services. And there is quite a lot of ideas. I already posted in the chat uh, uh, two Linux boot documents uh, where they have a bunch of concepts how this can be done. There are even some mad one like you know running this in VM or something like that. Uh, 
but but I believe it is worth uh, looking at those documents. And there is this uh, this channel, Stuart. I know you are on the Slack. Yeah. Um, uh, there are there are a lot of people like fighting around that, and maybe that's good community to try to throw a question at them. And I believe Daniel probably will have way better ideas. <laughs> Stuart, I think yes. uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Daniel. I'll talk after this. Uh, all right, thank you. So, yeah, so, you know, I'm one of the ones that was bringing up the issue of, of the firmware, right? It's one of the problems we've long struggled with the, with the DRTM environments. Um, you know, at, at the end of the day, you know, we have capabilities and things like AMD that uh, get disabled by, by OEMs that would allow us to do this exact kind of containerization. So, um, but yeah, at the end of the day, it's, it's Microsoft's went down the same path, right? You're going to have to containerize your firmware somehow. Um, but you know, just like the reason why it gets disabled on AMD is that the OEMs are not, don't want to do that. They want to be at that highest privilege level. And so, you know, this is you, the, the challenge is you're going to have to strike a balance with the OEMs on how, how you're going to get them to be okay with being in a privileged environment. Okay. Sorry, all I was going to say is that um, I have at least the same problem with AML. Because any AML which exists could have been tampered with by the prior OS. And even though that is somewhat sandboxed, it still has the facilities poke things in ways in which we do not understand. Sorry. So, so yeah, I would, so I think by far, I think AMD is the one that I, I, I'm, I'm most impressed with in their, the way they did in the containerization. Um, it's an appendix D inside of their, their system guide. So uh, as far as I can tell, I don't think even AML would be able to uh, break out of that containerization because it's, it uses the hardware virtualization to containerize the uh, firmware. I think the point I was trying to make is that even if you containerize this stuff, the reason you're invoking it to begin with is because it's another piece of hardware, right? And if you don't know how the piece of hardware is going to respond to that code doing arbitrary things, it doesn't matter if you put that code and get access to the device, because poking that device may have an impact on your system. So, okay. so that becomes a rabbit hole. Though. I think that's what I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, virtualizing things is certainly a good idea. And I think, as Stuart mentioned, uh, our bishop has looked at doing this in the past on ARM sixty four, and we have ways in which we could we we could in theory put some of these things into like virtual machines in more less privileged context. But the big thing is, you just can't reason that it's secure. Well, yeah. but like, but I guess um, Mark, if um, I mean, so the one way a device could affect, you know, affect you by, you know, by this code poking it would be like DMA, but, you know, we have mechanisms for that, right? So we, we already know how to safely assign devices um, to VMs. And so um, wouldn't that address that? Or? Sorry, but the reason that you're normally poking, sorry, there's a difference between the uh, assignable interfaces of devices, sorry, but the virtual machine assignable interfaces and the sorts of things that get poked by firmware, right? Because like, what you assign to a VM is normally like PCIe virtual function or like a, an MMIO device where you know it doesn't do DMA or you know it's contained, constrained behind it, an IMMU or something like that. Whereas the right. sorts of things that AML is normally poking, things like clock controllers and power gates and whatever. So it's very easy for this to, you, so you can't really containerize it in the same way. Yeah, that's why I was saying it, you start running down the rabbit hole, right? Because the fact is, is that we don't have any trust mechanisms for a lot of our hardware in place that we can say, oh, I know my hardware hasn't been camp can, can tampered with or tampered with or block that tampering from happening. So, um, I mean, there's been, there's, I've, I've participated in some committees that are trying to drive trust into hardware, but until we get something in place, yeah, all we can do is the best, the best we can do is containerize what we can, can understand what's, what has more risk than other things and, um, you know, system system builders and system designers need to, to take those things into account. Um, 
We have about five minutes left. So there, there's one. There was one other topic I wanted to raise, um, which uh, was a just a, a point about how TPMs were going to are going to be have to be implemented on ARM. So. So, so one key thing about DRTM is that the TPM, say you have a discrete TPM chip, um, can't be directly accessed by, by Linux, for example, because there's dynamic localities that have to be protected and, you know, and, and resettable only by the DRTM implementation. So whether that's by, by you know, DRTM at running at EL3, like in this picture here, or whether it's in a coprocessor or something, um, we have to have a way that access to the TPM is mediated and the way we do that typically on ARM, you'll see on ARM servers is that there's a TPM service running at secure EL0 that offers, um, you know, like a command response buffer interface um, and it proxies commands to the physical TPM. And so right now there's not really, um, I mean, this is, this is done today. So there are some examples in the, in the Linux kernel of a, of a CRV driver that uses an SMC call based interface to, to send commands. But I think the thing that's missing right now is any concept of localities. So there's no way to express like um, via the SMC call method, um, what localities is accessing the TPM and so on. And so, um, and also I don't think there's a way um, today that the CRB buffer um, can, can be allocated by the kernel. The, the way we see it, what we want it to work is where the TPM driver allocates a CRB and then, you know, tells the service where it is because this is normal world memory. Um, and so, and then, you, you know, they, they can share that buffer to, to send and receive TPM commands. So I guess the question I have is, whether anyone you know who who you know is familiar with the TPM driver infrastructure sees an issue with allocating a CRB in this way, where we have the TPM driver allocate the buffer, um, which you know, which, which I don't, there's not an example of that today, but I think that's how we want it to work. And so I just wanted to at least raise this as a as a question for TPM Linux experts. But why would you do it this way? The localities are designed to work so that it's only accessible from, you have three levels. You just make individual localities accessible from each level. Each level can have their own driver and they can touch the TPM separately. So you wouldn't need to do anything in Linux to fix it for this, except let it know which localities it can't use. Yeah, so with respect to localities, I think, yeah, I don't see a big issue there um, where you're right. So, so I think the let's say like a locality four, for example, which we definitely want protected. Um, Linux will not be able to access that locality. Um, I guess, but the question about like say just that locality zero. Um, what we want is for the CRB for locality zero to be allocated by Linux in in Linux memory, and then the address of that buffer being shared with the the TPM service and saying, okay, here here's where you need to. This is where the, the CRB is, and then the, those two sides use that shared memory to communicate. That, that's what's new. I don't see an example of that, and I'm wondering if there's any conceptual issues anyone sees with... Yeah, can, can I just ask why that needs to be dynamically allocated? Because I understood that one of the reasons for statically allocating this today was that it simplified all of the secure side because you didn't have to dynamically go and change like the translation tables and whatever that had to go and provide access to that mapping. I guess. So what's the what's the reason to need to do it tonight? Um, think about yeah, I, I guess. I mean, the reason I I mean, so there's this framework called FFA firmware framework A, which is is a way that we implement secure partitions and, and secure services. And so, in talking to Achin, who's the architect here at ARM on that, um, the natural flow there is that the client allocates shared memory and shares it with the service versus the other way around. Um, so that, that's true for FFA, but this isn't FFA, so why does it need to follow the FFA interface? If this is an existing standard and it's already implemented. Well, well I guess what we're, what we're trying to figure out is how, how can we map CRB onto FFA, right? If FFA is the transport between um, Linux and the service, um, 
I mean, that, what, what we want is to, is to do that. Is we want to use FFA as the underlying infrastructure to, do, to send TPM start requests. And so the natural way to do it would be, the natural so, way to do that would be, you know, using um, a client allocated buffer. So that, that, that's the question. Um, so, so one of the things I would say is to take a step back, and I think maybe this is what James was trying to get at, was that localities is meant to be a hardware authentication method. It's a way for the hardware to basically say the TPM is now allowed uh, to be accessed in this locality. Um, I mean, and I, this goes back to you know, our discussions in the spec, I would, you know, brings up a good question is, is there ever going to be a time when you're going to exit your your secure mode like you can on txt um, if not then as as soon as you finished your drtm you're now in the dynamic you're in the dynamic system at this point you've done the dynamic authentication with the hardware so you should be able to enter locality two and just leave it in locality two you'd have access to everything you have in locality zero um, and uh, there's the fact is, is you are in the dynamic runtime. So all your operations should be from the state that the hardware is in the dynamic runtime um, and no need to switch localities at that point. Um, and then if there's reasons that you want to restrict access, then that would be the responsibility and in, in the, the driver that's interfacing it. So if you want to restrict application interfaces, that would be a responsibility of the Linux driver to restrict access to commands or interfaces. Uh, within the TPM, within that locality. And then I think the other thing is, we actually have a spec, it's not the TPM spec, but it's the TIS spec that actually allows you to share access to an individual locality between multiple components. It does actually have a sort of back off and an algorithm of checking if the TPM is busy and everything. We use that in those TIS drivers. So if you actually implemented that driver, you wouldn't need a shared command response buffer. Okay, I know we're out of time. So yeah, th thanks for the um, for the. No, you've got three minutes for me to break you yet. Okay, I see. Um, so yeah, I think I, I think we'll you know we'll continue the discussion on that. Um, I, I think, I mean, I mean, I think the one thing, one key point is though is that, like, say access to locality four, for example. I mean, we have to have firmware or we have to have something mediate access to that, right? Because I guess typically we don't have memory map TPMs on ARM typically, right? So you're going to have a SPI TPM or I2C TPM. And, um, and so it's not like we have hardware. That, that's a the, whole, the whole of the locality infrastructure is designed to be for a memory map TPM. That's why the TIS interface specifies it. All the registers are mapped four times, each in a different locality. It's then up to firmware or the bootloader to protect each of the localities correctly. Is there just no way you can do that? Actually, actually it's the PCH that actually on on x86 that controls it because it's a hardware authentication. So yeah, so there you need some kind of platform hardware to do that, which which right. most arms. I mean, there are arm systems that do it. I mean, I, well, I have seen one, but there's not. We can't count but, on. A memory mapped interface to the TPM. Um, I don't think that's right. why. We actually need, sorry, I don't think we actually need any hardware here whatsoever because, as you've mentioned, yeah, like the existing interface of bouncing a notification up to EL3 means that you can implement all of that locality filtering in the secure EL0 component in that service yeah. because it can know where you initiated the call from. So I don't think there's any hardware requirement whatsoever here. There's just some context information that we require and some policy that we require to be implemented somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. The DRTM should signal to the TPM that it entered the hardware locale or into the dynamic runtime at that point. Uh, that's what happens on, on x86. When the instructions called, the, the CPU will notify the PCH that it can now allow access to those uh, MMIO address spaces for localities uh, one through four. Well, not through four because that's only accessible by the, the CPU, but um, but yeah. I think the one thing, however, that we might need here, which you've hinted at, is that if on other systems uh, there are separate instances of the interface for each locality, and we're saying we might only have a single interface, we would need a mechanism to specify which locality we're targeting within that interface. 
Is, is that a correct statement or have I misunderstood entirely? Yeah, I think I mean, that's, that's my understanding as well. By interface to target locality, you mean from Linux or just in the lower level driver? Because all of the Linux drivers have a locality targeting mechanism. It's oh, not much Linux, used. Because, sorry, we just need to make it for it to communicate that to the uh, TPM service running in Securial Zero. Well, but we already have standard mechanisms. The TIS mechanism has that. If we already have that, I was just on that. All right. Thanks, everyone. I know we're out of time, so appreciate the discussion. Thanks, Derek.
Hey, Daniel, I think your audio might be disconnected again because I can't hear you. So Daniel asking me to um, introduce your talk. So welcome to the stage, uh, Ross Philipson from Oracle and uh, Daniel Smith from Apparatus Consulting. And uh, they will be talk, uh, talking about Trendwood secure launch status and upstream, upstream efforts. Okay. You'll need to make me presenter. Uh, that's how to do that. The question is... And if I, uh, yeah, I have that just a second. Yep. Does it work? Um, yeah, yep, yeah, I got control now. Great. All right, so thank you, Piotr, for that introduction. So, um, yes, I'm Daniel Smith from Apertus Solutions. I believe Ross is on the call or is in the, in, on, on the, the meeting here. Um, so, uh, we'll do our best to, to cover any questions you all have. This will be um, pretty short um, in terms of the slides. So just a quick overview of, of where we're at with Secure Launch. Um, so the purpose of this discussion is just kind of give a quick recap and then try to dive into um, you know, discussions about what, where we need to go to, to finish getting this or get this moving in terms of being upstream into Linux. Um, so if you have any questions about more of the de in-depth details, you know, we've, we've presented a few times. Here's two, one, two uh, conferences you can take a look at where we've gone into some uh, detail about all this. So Secure Launch for Linux. So it is a capability being developed underneath the Trench, Pro Trench Boot project to give Linux the ability to um, be directly launched as part of a dynamic launch. Um, the primary focus right now is to is around the first launch use case, which is re typically referred to as an early launch. So this is where you know, your bootloader is going to be loading your OS or loading Linux and launching it via DRTM. Um, so we what we did and and the approach to this was instead of trying to create a whole new custom uh, entry point to Linux, we try to use reuse as much as possible um, and follow the standard patterns for how new entry points are being are added to the Linux kernel. Um, so that's where, like it says here, we've you know we leveraged UEFI support for handling the EBS handoffs. Um, and then on Intel platforms, we actually wired in the S exit uh, instruction into the sh all the shutdown paths so that way we can control uh, or we can properly close out um, the, the DRT or the TXT um, so that way your platforms can shut down nicely. Um, so, and then along with that, to enable being able to do that, you need a bootloader that's capable of in, uh, initiating um, uh, a dynamic launch. So there's, there is actually two patch sets in progress going to Grub to enable it to, to both launch from a, uh, Intel platform as well as an AMD platform. Um, so in order to be able to do this, there's actually two additional components to launch both on AMD and Intel. Uh, one is actually directly provided by Intel. That's the Intel ACM. 
And then on AMD, there's the need for a secure loader, which Trenchboot is in the process of developing our own uh, secure loader since uh, none is provided by AMD. They, they open the specification and then they uh, leave it to the user to, to build an implementation. So, um, and then let's see, oh, dynamic launcher located. So, so, um, so at the end of the day, both, both Intel and AMD is in progress and going up for grub. Um, oh, I guess I can't use arrows. Okay. So in terms of capabilities, we've already gotten upstream. So there was the kernel info patch set that was uh, to meet one of the needs we needed for the Linux kernel to be able to uh, convey the extra boot information. Um, typically that's done with the setup header, but it, those that are aware, it's out of, uh, there's very limited space and they're very cautious about adding anything new to the setup header. So we collaborated with HPRM and came up with the kernel infrastructure. Uh, Daniel Keeper, you know, worked with him and they basically have got that solution or that, that patch set already merged. Um, so now we're basically down to the primary secure launch feature. Um, that leverages that, obviously. Um, one of the issues that came up during this process is the fact that um, ideally you want to store the measurements as they're taken. And since the entry points into the kernel is always in the, the um, real-time kernel, the, uh, um, the compression kernel, there's not a lot of infrastructure in there. There's a lot of it's just there just to bootstrap to get to the, to the main kernel, to the, the piggy. Um, so in early implementations, we, we came up with a, a, some TPM access code that we put into it to there to, to manage that. Um, unfortunately that does create two different implementations for TPM access in the kernel. So the TPM maintainers really didn't want to see that. Um, so obviously, you know, we, we were trying to work with them. The, uh, unfortunately the TPM driver has a lot of dependencies on the, uh, the runtime uh, or the, the decompressed kernel infrastructure. Uh, question here. If you're, I mean, if I go back to Peter Jones's point that most people boot from UEFI, why don't you just use the existing UEFI driver? It should work until exit boot services, no. which is it can't. Easy. Exit boot services is called by Grub. So in DRTM, you're required to call EBS before you call the uh, S enter instruction. So exit boot services have already been called by the time you, you enter into this. Um, okay, the, but can you go back to the babies? I mean, we deliberately shifted exit boot services into the kernel in the EFI stub. Could you not do the same? So, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't follow that question. So, so what are we going to move into the to the? Well, the, the problem if you call exit boot services is you actually lose the boot lock. Right, so you have to find a way of passing boot log to the kernel. And because of all these problems, we actually moved exit boot services into the kernel startup code, right, for so, EFI. So now we can collect the boot log and we can do everything else, but that should theoretically also mean we can use the uh, UEFI TPM driver until we do that. So, so that is why Daniel Keeper and Alec uh, presented the uh, log infrastructure that they, the firmware and boot log infrastructure that they were presenting today. That, that is to address that very problem, so that a way the boot lock can be passed along to the operating system, or to Linux. Because the fact, okay, but if when you read the TXT spec, I understand what you're saying, but the, the fact is, is that the TXT spec, and there's reasons why you want to do this, is you want to, you want EBS closed, called, you want boot surfaces gone before you start the DRTM. Right. That's that's the whole purpose, because if you don't now you're incorporating all of that stuff into uh, into your DRTM environment. Right. And the whole purpose of this is to reduce that that attack surface, reduce how much we're actually having to keep inside of the trusted uh, base in terms of what's being launched. It, 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 in okay. addition, in addition to that, the. Um... The, uh, the 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 call to S enter is going to take control of all the uh, APs, and um, it would it would leave uh, it would leave U e UEFI scratching its head as to what happened to all of its control over the yeah. all of the uh, processors after it, it returned from S, S enter, and we've seen like terrible crashes due to that. 
So that's another reason why you have to exit boot services first. Yeah. So there's there's security reasons why you want to do it, and there's the, the technical reasons why you, you, you need to do it. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, we need to be able to, um, and then one of the things about secure launch is obviously the whole purpose is to take measurements before you start executing. And so once some of the things we want to make sure we measure as part of the DRTM launch into Linux is, is all of this outside information that's coming in, the boot, uh, the command line, um, the decompression of the PEGI that is the right one, all this stuff. So we, we take these measurements. And so ideally you want to get them into the TPM as early as possible. Um, but I, you know, I had some, uh, discussions with a few colleagues and they brought up the point that, you know, for the most part, you haven't changed who's in control when you move from the piggy to the, uh, or from the, the compressed kernel to, to the decompressed kernel. Um, so it, it is okay to just carry those measurements across. And then when you finally get access to the, to the TPM, you can then send those measurements. Um, you know, down the road, we can always, uh, we, we do have a patch set where we kept, we kept our TPM code in place. So that if somebody wants to use a um, out of tree patch, it's there. Um, but I mean, ultimately, you know, if we can work with the, the maintainers and just find a way to create a um, um, shareable code base that can be used by both the, the compressed kernel and the decompressed kernel, that would be the, um, the big one. But it, you know, I, I looked at it so many times trying to figure out how I could do it, and it was just going to be major surgery to the, to the TPM driver. It just, um, and I mean, it's just that's that's beyond the scope of what we were trying to do here. Um, so that, you know, that brings us today. So you know, we had an initial RFC back in March of 2020. Um, you know, we've had four follow up submissions. Uh, the fourth one just posted just this past August. Um, you know, we've tried to address every issue that we can, um, or explain why, uh, we don't feel it's the, or our view on the issue. Um, so at that point, at this point, we're kind of like, okay, let's, let's start talking with, with the maintainers and let's see what, what do we need to do to, to keep this moving forward? Is there additional things we need to address? Um, is there, you know, what else do we need to, uh, do to keep this moving forward? And so at that point, just kind of. As this is the last slide, so just any questions? Yeah. So, I mean, questions, discussions. So, I have a question on the TPM side. Uh, when the when you're deferring the measurements to be extended uh, by the uncompressed kernel, I mean, for the later kernel. So. Uh, so how the logs are being done? So when the OS Linux kernel extends to the TPM, it appends to the TPM firmware log, which it had received from uh, UEFA? Yeah, so so there is actually, so the DRTM has a, its own log. Um, it's actually on Intel, it's, it's set up by the the, uh, the firmware. So the, uh, uh, the, um, the ACM, the BIOS ACM sets up the, the log space for it, um, or well, sets up the scratch space and then the grub uses it or the preamble will set up the, um, when we go through the, as we take the measurements, we, we log the measurements into that log. Um, and then when we get, to, we put markers, non-event markers within the log to, to denote when the kernels, the, the, um, the, comp the com compressed kernel starts taking measurements until it's completed taking measurements, it'll put a non-event into the log there. And so that way, when we come, when we get into the decompressed kernel, um, we have logic in there that basically finds the, finds the event and then walks through each log event and um, does the uh, uh, TPM extend at that point. So that way, the extends will line up with what's in the log. Okay, okay. So but these are not done atomically. It means the log has been updated earlier itself, and then the uh, PCRs are updated afterwards. Is what you're saying? Correct. 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 So again, it goes back to the point of this is kind of viewed as a acceptable because we the log is under the control of the kernel. The kernel contain maintains control of the system all the way through until it starts to run launch the uh, runtime. Um, so 
Yes, it takes the measurements earlier, holds them to the side, and then it, it extends them into the to the TPM. Um, so does that open an, a, a chance for for a talk -tow kind of attack? Yes, but I mean, with the DRTM launch, the whole point of this is that you the the kernel is in a very controlled state. DMA has been blocked. Interrupts have been uh, well, actually, the interrupts come back online. So there are some chances for SMM to, to put, potentially tamper at that point. Um, but outside of that, you know, the the, the kernel is in, in control of the system. Okay. And I had one more question. So when you, from the, when the logs are coming from UEFI, I think they get copied to the kernel memory, right? After the exit boot services in your uncompressed, sorry, in your compressed kernel as well. That means uh, the the firmware log is no more the same what the kernel has been exposing. Is that right? Um, I'm not. Uh, probably uh, I'm not understood something else. So <laughs> correct me if I'm missing out something. But what I'm trying to understand is like generally, it currently like the logs get exposed from UEFI after exit boot services, they get copied to kernel memory, I think. And then kernel doesn't append anything there. But now what I'm understanding is that after they are copied, the kernel is changing it. And so, so there's, so again, there's two separate logs. There's the SRTM log that's created by the firmware and there's the DRTM log that's created as part of the DRTM process. So there's two separate logs here. Oh, okay. Oh, Okay, and the DRTM log is what getting up in there. Okay, thank yes. you. No problem. So, Daniel, um, you mentioned yeah. that in this model, uh, you do exit boot services in Grub, and then basically you enter the kernel skipping the existing EFI boot stub that's used? Uh, so again, we, 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 so I wouldn't say we're skipping it. We reuse parts of it to handle some of the, the, uh, um, the, uh, what do you want to say? Set up from a, from an EFI environment. Uh, Ross can, Ross can kind of dive into a little bit more detail. Since he kind of worked all this but, out, but you know, we're so I, I, Grub triggers code in the kernel, and then you go back to Grub, and then you call exit boot services. No, 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 no. It works, no. It, it works in that way that uh, the Grub uh, initializes the platform and sets up everything for uh, DRTM initialization, calls exit boot services, and uh, passes the control to the uh, ACM using uh, S enter instruction. And right. then ACM passes the control to the kernel using uh, uh, a bit, uh, I remember correctly, different entry point uh, specified in mm -hmm. the kernel. Okay, but, so but, the EFI boot stub is not executed. Yeah. Yeah, right, exactly. Right. So how is that not skipping the EFI boot stub? Well, so again, it's, it's not, so if you want to be, you know, very technical about it, very nuanced about it, yes, it's skipping it, but it's not like we're completely ignoring it, right? We reuse some of those code paths in there. Uh, I so think you that reuse code I think that's that there is... in the kernel, or you've copied that code out of the kernel into Grub or into some other code base? I think that there's a confusion here. Uh, uh, we are using uh, early startup code from the kernel. We are not uh, reusing uh, uh, EFI stub. Uh, so EFI stub from the kernel is not used. We use uh, uh, we reuse some early startup code. And uh, after that, we also use uh, some code uh, which is uh, in, uh, used to initialize the platform in the kernel proper. But I think that Ross can uh, uh, reply, uh, can provide more details how, how it works. But I'm sure that the EFI stuff itself is skipped and not executes, uh, executed when you uh, use the DRTM. Right. 
I guess the, the key point is like, we didn't reinvent parsing the EFI boot table, right? That's all provided. Um, and we, we reuse the code that knows how to parse that table, right? We just so the, the, the EFI boot stub is code that is executed within that is in the kernel, but is executed in the boot services environment. Yeah, no, that does not get that does not okay. happen. So yep. in that scenario, we then end up with two distinct mechanisms for executing the kernel based on whether or not we're going into DRTM. And the amount of information that we've extracted from the boot services environment is then uh, distinct between these. So as an example, right now we have code in the boot services environment, in the boot stub that's involved in parsing the event logs in order to be able to pass the boot services um, SRTM TPM event log up to the runtime kernel. Mm -hmm. And if none of that code is being executed, uh, so that's one example, but there are other cases where in order to integrate with the firmware, we need to basically have code that is owned by the kernel, but which is executed in the boot services environment. You're basically skipping all of that. And that means that we're going to have disparity in functionality between scenarios where people are doing a DRTM launch and where people are not doing a DRTM launch. So, so no, so, so so the, the, the information, that, that information is extracted by Grub, right? Mm -hmm. There is a header that's passed. No, it's generally not abstracted by Grub. Grub does not currently do anything to copy the, if you're right now just using Grub and calling exit boot services in Grub, then you do not get the TPM2 event log in Linux. It doesn't work. The only way you get the TPM2 event log in Linux at the moment is by calling the EFI entry point, which then executes boot services code within, that is with part of the kernel. And I, the TPM event log is really not the interesting part of this for the DRTM case. Uh, I'm just using that as an example of something that exists there. The kernel does need to have a fairly intimate degree of knowledge of the firmware it's booting from. And some of what we're currently relying on is in the bootstub code. Now, a bunch of this is because you know, Microsoft don't have to deal with this because they own the bootloader and the kernel simultaneously, and they can move both of those in lockstep. But on the Linux side, we've sort of gone for, if we're adding new functionality to the kernel, we put that code in the kernel because we don't know which bootloader people are going to be using. And the presumption has been if we're booting on EFI, we will execute the kernel's early EFI code. You're skipping that. And as a result, we're going to end up with some features that are just not going to work. Uh, I, that I, don't think that would be, I don't think that's the case. I, I it disagree. is extremely the case. I, I, I disagree. I mean, we could. Okay, so um, how right now do you get the SRTM TPM2 event log in the DRTM environment? Um, is Russ still on with us? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Are we lo are we losing the SRTM log? I thought that's what um, Alex, uh, the whole purpose of Alex's work is. Right. So right now you're losing it. You have a potential path to not losing it, but right now you're losing it. Yes. Yep. Okay. So that, like I said, that's an example. There are other cases where we are potentially going to add stuff into the kernel to integrate with a new UEFI feature where we need to have code that's happening in the boot services environment. Because you're skipping that, because you're relying well, so on then I would ask, so instead, you're basically saying that when we're adding features to the kernel, we're going to have to also add that to any bootloaders that we care about. Otherwise, it's just going to be a functional disparity between the DRTM scenario and the non-DRTM scenario. And I, so at that point, I would say, you know, maybe some, maybe some thought needs to be given to ex, um, figuring out how this tight coupling has occurred should be looked at getting decoupled. So one way of potentially doing this would be that rather than, right now the EFI boot stub is basically a thing where you jump into that, the EFI boot stub executes a bunch of code and then it is the thing that calls the kernel entry point. 
So in principle, something that could be done would be instead of doing all you're doing in Grub, do it in the EFI boot stub instead. And then just have basically have Grub treat the kernel as an EFI executable, call into this entry point, and then the kernel is responsible for doing, the boot stub is responsible for doing the secure launch of the actual kernel payload after it's done all this setup and populated boot params and so on. And then you can measure that as necessary. And that way the kernel is also aware of what data it's passing to the later stages, which is information you potentially want to be able to measure. So that would be one way of doing it. Another would be maybe we should have some way of passing an argument this where we call the EFI boot stub but don't actually pass control to the kernel. Basically do the setup code, have the kernel be able to provide a bunch of setup code, and then have bootloaders be able to execute that setup code, but then pass control back to the bootloader so, rather than now, having the code to execute the kernel itself. So now you're pushing two different, you're gonna create a new entry point into the kernel. Well, you're already doing that. Right, exactly. Actually, uh, hang on, hang on. Wait, we don't have to do that. What we can do is we could actually build the EFI boot stubs as a separate binary, but then knows how to call its current entry point into the kernel. You could separately measure that binary using the standard measured and secure boot things, and we could effectively do a two-stage boot in the kernel. I mean, it's horrible, but it may be acceptable to your SRTM, uh, your DRTM case. Would that work? So, so just just a bit of history, I actually, the original design was to actually do it all inside the setup, um, but not exactly in the same, same manner, but that was found not to be acceptable or doable. So I, I would have to go back and look and, and maybe there's a different way to try to do it. We're not proposing that you would be in charge of this. The kernel would be in charge of this, but we would separate out the code so that you could get trust for the DRTM. That's the essential key feature. This code would be evolved in lockstep with the kernel that was uh, working on, right? So we get all of the features we need in the kernel versions we need. Okay. But, okay. I mean, I, I guess I would need to see more of how that would exactly work. Um, Oh, there's no I'm hand waving wildly here, to be clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I'm just I'm trying to think of how, how this would be different than what no we're doing. <laughs> but yeah, outside of being I, a separate binary, but I mean, at that point, I mean, yeah. I think really what I'm trying to say here is that we need the kernel to be able to provide code that executes before exit boot services. And we need, if the presumption is that the bootloader is going to be responsible for, for calling exit boot services, we need a way to execute that code before the bootloader so, calls so exit instead of, and does your handoff. Right. So instead of creating a whole new binary, again, why not do that in Grub? Because there is a there is a structure Grub that, is you know, not maintained by the same people that maintain the kernel. And we cannot guarantee so also we can't guarantee updates. People expect to be able to use Grub from like 17,000 years ago and still boot a modern kernel and have the modern kernel provide the set of features that the modern kernel supports. So we're not, like I said, Microsoft don't have to deal with this because they're able to tie the bootloader to the kernel. We don't have that luxury. And so a bunch of design decisions that have been made are basically focused on the fact that we need this code to live in the kernel because we can't rely on the bootloader to do this for us. Well, also Microsoft does have this problem because they have to then evolve their bootloader in lockstep with their kernel because what you're talking about is intimate details you're passing between something in the pre-exit boot and something in the post-exit boot. Right. And all we want um, is that 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 to be able to control whatever needs the information in the post-exit boot. It has to be done. Their, their, bootloader, right. their bootloader basically is the EFI stub. The way they're, they're organized, they're building their bootloader out of the kernel tree and they just don't have the second step in the kernel. One thing might help. There's not an expectation like a... that you can use the Windows, that you can use the Windows 10 bootloader. To, well, you can't use the Windows 8 bootloader to boot the Windows 10 kernel. That's not a thing that works. They've got a separate hands-off protocol for every kernel version and bootloaders support that. 
I think one thing that might help to think about this is this is the exact same problem as k-executing from an older kernel to a new kernel, where that older kernel does not have the new functionality in the EFI stub, and it has already done the exit boot services. So we're, we must, in those cases, support a less featureful set of EFI th of things that we could have got from EFI anyway. So, and also you, you mentioned of supporting an old version of Grub or whatever, it would be absolutely fine. You just don't get this launch regardless of where it's built. So I'm not sure there's actually a strong argument either way for it being in Grub or the EFI stub, if you think about it that way. Yeah, the other, the other problem is, is like, again, we're trying to come up with a unified way of, of, of providing this um, across x86, across, or, or in, actually Intel and AMD are actually different. Um, and then we also, as part of what uh, Stuart was mentioning, which is where, you know, we're looking at get, trying to get to next is to be able to uh, handle this case for ARM. Like how do we, we want, we don't want like, you know, three different entry points for three different DRTM capabilities. We want to have this nice, clean, single entry point for all the architectures that are capable. And I forgot, Fiotr is doing power. power I to be, yeah, I was just saying that argument is actually a very strong argument for doing it in the EFI stuff, because then there is one consistent interface. Whereas if you're not doing it in the EFI stuff, you have a per architecture interface for launching the kernel. From so, the but on, on power, we don't have uh, UFI. Yeah? We typically not use UFI on power. And um, and we also would would be glad to implement the RTM there because everything, for example, on Power Nine seems to be there in terms in terms of hardware. There is some missing pieces in firmware, but maybe maybe someone can develop that. But on the other side, we would glad to we would like to have some support in in the higher layers, in bootloader and kernel. Uh, and it would be great to have a consistent way. If I understood correctly, uh, Matthew, you proposed uh, to have a separate EFI protocol, which is installed by bootloader and which can initialize the platform for, for the kernel. Am I right? Uh, I think propose is too strong a word here. Okay. Uh, okay. But, yeah. Uh, so. In theory, we could, right now, we link the EFI setup code into the kernel. Yeah. And okay. really, what that EFI setup code is doing is making a bunch of EFI calls, uh, which culminates in exit boot services, but that's not inherently necessary, and generates a set of data structures. Uh, in some cases, it's actually it's doing stuff like modifying boot params and passing stuff in there. In other cases, it's installing a configuration table that can be accessed later. So it's doing, it's basically some code that is executed, which in one or two cases may actually touch hardware in order to deal with platform quirks. But fundamentally, we're executing something in order to have information to hand off to the kernel. And then we're calling exit boot services and handing off to the kernel. There's nothing fundamental about that that says that that code has to be part of the kernel image. So one scenario, which I think James was suggesting, was support building a kernel as we do now, but take the EFI setup code that we are linking into the kernel and also have that available as an independent binary that basically does all of that, that generates a data structure, but which doesn't call exit boot services. And then you'd be able to call into that from Grub or you know wherever, do that, have that generate all the information necessary to pass off to the kernel, go back to Grub or whatever, do your dynamic launch, but pass the information you got back from that up to the runtime kernel, and potentially do um, potentially measure that if any part of it is considered security critical. So, so let me ask you this: Why why couldn't that just be done in the shim? And outside of calling EBS, how have, have the shim do worry about doing all the setup stuff? Sorry, which shim are we referring to here? Uh, I guess technically there's two of them, right? There's so there's the Red Hat maintained one, and then there's the uh, uh, Linux Foundation. Uh, uh, so shim is shim knows nothing about Linux, and well, the the is, is nothing about Linux. 
Actually, the answer is simpler than that. The information we're passing is tightly coupled to the kernel version. Whatever passes it has to be tightly built with the kernel. We can't use Shim because that's, even Shim's pace of development is too slow. We are talking about a tightly coupled system that we don't want to decouple because it creates an API mistake. Would it be simpler to uh, have an, an EFI protocol which has a quite well-defined interface and this protocol could be installed by the uh, provided by bootloader uh, and wait and really uh, the the important point here is that we can't we don't want to rely on the bootloader for EFI setup we want the kernel to be able to do the EFI setup work when I say the kernel it doesn't I don't literally mean uh, the running code that is executing on the system once we're running Linux. I mean code that is shipped out of the kernel tree. And right now the simplest way for us to do that is to link it into the kernel. But I think the actual feature request here is for there to be some way in the trench boot model for the kernel to provide EFI setup code that can be executed before we enter the actual kernel. And the Precise details of that. Anything. Okay, I understand. Okay, we can just discuss it later. Okay, I understand. Yeah. Okay, um, I unfortunately have to get going. I have to give another talk here in a moment. Uh, any any last questions for myself? Thanks, Daniel, for, the, for, Thank doing, for Dan, Daniel and Ross for doing presentation. And no problem. Thank and you. James, uh, uh, and Matthew and James for uh, for for your input. Okay, so I think that we are done for today. Uh, we can open the stage for any discussion related to the, the system boot and security, if you want to. So, so in light of what we were just discussing, I know Daniel Smith is gone, but in light of what we were just discussing, I mean, would a, would a good next step be to possibly produce some sort of RFC uh, around how to, how to approach what was just brought up by, by, uh, by Matthew and James? Um, and, and, you know, post that and get some, get, get some discussions going on that? Because at this point, like someone said, it's just a kind of we're just kind of hand waving, saying, you know, this is this is the problem, but um, you know, what what the actual solution is. There could be several ways to, to approach this. I think that the best solution will be to meet uh, together with Daniel and maybe with James and uh, and Matthew, have a call and to have a. Um, uh, to have a discussion about uh, about these issues, and I think that we have at least two issues uh, here. One is how to probably start the trench boot on the UFI platform, and another is DPM. Uh, if we solve this, we we don't have the DPM issue, I think. Or have. we'll see. So my my proposal is to meet and to discuss various solutions, maybe internally in the technical project and later with Matthew and J James. Well, I propose within plumbers, so just use one of the hack rooms. We just need to coordinate. Okay, makes sense for me. When, James, uh, when you are free? Well, that's the problem, right? Because I'm supposed to be supervising the off sessions on Friday and that this, and I mean, basically it's now, if we can get uh, the other guy back, but uh, Thursday is also a possibility. I thought I was supervising a session on Thursday, but I'm not. Thursday uh, is much better uh, for me than Friday because I have some uh, family uh, errands to run. So Thursday uh, is much better. I, I don't know about Daniel Smith, but Thursday probably won't work for me. I'm going on vacation soon. And... Oh, okay. 
Um, I have a, so tomorrow's not going to be a good day, and Friday's oh, definitely no. out. Uh, should we well, what about after by email and then just sort of make sure that we have a basic understanding, make sure that we all have a basic understanding of the issues we're talking about. And then if it seems that a higher bandwidth conversation would be necessary, figure out some way of handling that. Makes sense for me. What else? That seems opinion? reasonable. Actually, since you're all matrix now, we could just create a temporary matrix room for this so you could have a, an online discussion. Okay. So I think Ross, that we are uh, Ross, Piotr, and Daniel Smith, we we should uh, sit down and work on on the provide some description what we want and what we need and why, and then put uh, uh, some proposals, and then yeah. uh, I think that then discuss uh, them with James and Matthew. Yeah. 